He brought me in, oh, His love for me. Oh, His love for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. My father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Who the sun sets free who oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God yes I am in my father's house there's a place for me I'm a child of God yes I am child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service today. We're so glad that you could join us for worship. We've got a great service planned. Ryan McCullough is going to bring the word on Psalm 139. But before we continue in worship, Krista's just going to read us a call to worship from the same psalm. This is Psalm 139, verses 13 to 18. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. You are here. I worship you, I worship you. 
worship you.
but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. going to be singing this next verse and one of the lines in it is so take this heart Lord I'll be your vessel the world to see your life in me and I just want to invite you to keep this line in your heart let it sink into your soul because when we're going about day to day doing our regular day to day things going to the grocery store the bank um you know, chatting with our neighbors or hanging out with our kids. This, this is what the important thing is, that we allow him to dwell in us and we allow him to shine through us in our day to day. So I just want to encourage you to meditate on that and uh, think about that. Now I have to sing. You take our failure, you take our weakness, you set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel. The Self-care. 
yourself down, raising up the broken to life. Okay, I'm, I'm good, thanks. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Sorry. Sorry, let's go again. I, uh, I wanted to say church. <clears throat> Good afternoon, church. <sighs> Man, okay. It's afternoon now, but it'll be morning then when they see it. Okay, remember this. Ready? Ready? <clears throat> Good morning, church. Confused? Thinking to yourself that someone must have messed up in the uh, editing this week? They must have forgotten to snip out these little intro bloopers, or maybe you know me well enough to suspect some nonsense. Well, hopefully that satisfied you. This is actually my opening illustration because this week I'd like to talk to you a little bit about control. Hi, I'm Ryan, Associate Pastor at Ross Carrick Church of Christ, and I'd like to welcome Hope for Life, Oak Park, and Ross Carrick this morning. Hello to all of those familiar faces. I'm sure it's nice for you to see me. And greetings to any new faces, which I'm also certain is nice for you to see me. It's my pleasure to be preaching this morning. Kelly was supposed to preach this week, but he is in the midst of a move. Very exciting times for him and his family, but very busy times. He asked me to step in in his leave. But back to the opening illustration. You see, it's a, it's a fascinating time, uh, season of worship services we are currently experiencing. And I'm not saying church season of church on purpose, because you see, the church is where you are. The church goes with you wherever you go. And what we do here is a worship service, and we are truly going through some interesting times. You see, the opening illustration would never have worked in our usual circumstances. If you were to make a mistake on a Sunday morning, you just have to roll with it. Maybe make a joke, maybe pause to regain your composure, but you still have to move forward. But here in this very empty room filled with a lot of construction, if I make a mistake, it's just one simple snip of a video, and you at home are none the wiser. If we make a mistake in a song, all we have to do is start over. There's a greater control over the content we are creating for these services, something none of us are really accustomed to. So I thought it would be fun to pull the wool over your eyes a little bit this morning, just to demonstrate to you a little bit of what lack of control could look like here in this setting. And that's the very thing I'd like us to discuss this morning. Control and the lack of control we have sometimes. This week we're continuing our Summer in the Psalms series and today we'll be going through Psalm 139. But before we get into it, I'd like to go over a few of my biases. I've always struggled to understand or deeply connect to the Psalms. The parts of the Bible that I'm most attracted to are the stories there within. The Psalms are, are part of what we call the books of poetry and wisdom. Now, I've always loved the wisdom side of this classification. Ecclesiastes and Job are two of my favorite books in the entirety of the Bible. But I've always struggled with the Psalms and, songs, and Song of Songs. But maybe that's because I've never really had the desire to compare my romantic partners to towers, sheep, and a variety of birds. Actually, I'll throw up a picture of what Solomon's partner looks like when you put these images that are represented, uh, that he uses to represent his love in a drawing. It's not a pretty sight. But the wisdom books, I love them. Ecclesiastes and Job have always spoken depths to me. However, a few years ago, in my small group, we read a book called Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In it, he details a glorious vision of everyday life lived well together with other people. The part that truly inspired me was his practice around daily, the discipline of daily reading his Bible. Every morning when he woke up, he read a chapter of the Old Testament, a chapter of the New Testament, and a psalm. Confession. I've always struggled with this discipline. I love my Bible, and when I read it, I thoroughly enjoy myself, but during different seasons of life, I find myself losing time for Bible reading to other more pressing activities or responsibilities. Reading about this practice in this book convicted me. 
Now, I'm not a morning person by any means, and I'm pretty certain this sermon will be one of my better delivered just for the fact that we're recording it in the afternoon. So instead of reading first thing in the morning, I opted instead to arrive to work a little earlier in the morning and spend some time in isolation just reading my Bible before my workday began. And for four months, I kept it up. Then summer came, and summer vacation with it. You see, I'm blessed that I get to work full-time at a school and I'm partial to the same breaks the students receive. So with summer, my routine fell apart, and with it, that same discipline. However, for four months, I read a psalm every day. Well, weekday. With it, I found a new appreciation for the words and images shared by the various writers. But when I set out to begin writing this sermon, I thought it would be best to begin with reading a book about the Psalms from a person whom I admire, C.S. Lewis. His reflections on on the Psalms are truly written for those who also struggle to read the Psalms. His goal was to help us better understand the place of the Psalms and you know, I really hate to do this, but I do have a quote to share this morning, and, you know, Lane and Kelly and Tim might not be super pumped that I'm sharing it, but here it goes. What must be said, however, is that the Psalms are poems, and poems intended to be sung, not doctrinal treatises, nor even sermons. I really stepped in it there. As I am about to share a sermon centered around a psalm, and we are currently spending a summer doing this very thing. But he goes on, those who talk of reading the Bible as literature sometimes mean, I think, reading it without attending to the main thing it is about. Like reading Burke with no interest in politics or reading the Enid with no interest in Rome. That seems to me to be nonsense. But there is a saner sense in which the Bible, since it is, after all, literature, cannot properly be read except as literature. And the different parts of it as the different sorts of literature they are. Most emphatically, The Psalms must be read as poems, as lyrics, with all the licenses and all the formalities, the hyperboles, the emotional rather than the logical connections, which are proper to lyric poetry. They must be read as poems if they are to be understood. No less than French must be read as French or English as English. Otherwise, we shall miss what it is in them and think we see what it is not. So I I guess moving forward, I'll be singing the rest of this sermon. (coughs) <coughs> do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. No. But put simply, the Psalms are filled with emotional truths and shouldn't be handled as theological tunes, tomes. So all of that to say that this morning I'll be ta- taking us through Psalm 139 and what that says to us today in this time and place. And to begin, I'm going to ask a special someone to do this week's reading. Good morning, church families. My name is Bob McCullough from Oak Park Church of Christ. My son Ryan will be delivering the message today, so I hope it doesn't offend anybody. But anyhow, he has asked me to read Psalm 139 for you, so please bear with me. Psalm 139. Yahweh, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I am an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there, then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I could go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You've already, you're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, a high God, your breathtaking body and soul. I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly 
how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you, the days of my life all prepared before I've even lived them. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful. God, I've, God, I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and live always with you. And please, God, do away with wickedness for good. And you murderers out, out here, all of the women and men who battle, who belittle you, God, infatuated with cheap God imitations, see how I hate those who hate you. Yahweh, see how I loathe all those godless arrogance. I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my enemies. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. Thank you. Thanks, Father. That was my dad. As you can see, I got the looks and the hair. Now that we've read through Psalm 139, let's begin this morning in Job. Now don't worry, I have a plan. You've got to trust me. You see, Job, like I said earlier, is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It begins in the land of Uz. And the Bible is clear that Job is a good man. Upright, respected, God-fearing, loving, and loved. He had a big family, a lot of livestock and land, many servants, a huge fortune, and a loving wife. The story goes that one day Satan and God made a wager. After some time on the earth, scouring it over and over, Satan enters into the Lord's presence. God takes this opportunity to present Satan with his prize follower, Job. God says that no one on earth is like him, that he is upright and blameless. Satan scoffs at God and challenges these notions. Of course he's blameless and upright. You have been protecting him, giving him all sorts of blessings. He only loves you because of what you have given him. I bet that if you take away all of his possessions, he will most certainly curse you. God is intrigued by this proposition, and he agrees to it. With one caveat, that Satan can do whatever he wishes with all of Job's blessings, his livestock, his land, his fortunes, his family, but he is to leave Job alone, not to harm him at all. To this, Satan agrees. So it came to be that Job learned that a rival tribe had come and stolen away all of his oxen and donkeys, that fire from the heavens had burnt, down, burnt up all of his sheep. Another tribe came and stole all of his camels, and that a mighty wind had destroyed his eldest son's home while all of his sons and daughters were celebrating inside. Job was left with nothing. But the Bible says that even with all that had happened to Job, he did not sin or turn away from God. Once again, Satan enters into the Lord's presence, and once again, the Lord presents Satan with his prize follower, Job. He is still blameless and upright. Despite all that you have done to him, he shuns evil and maintains his integrity. Well, of course he is still blameless and upright. Of course he maintains his integrity. You left him untouched. Any man will give up anything for his own life. Let me hurt him. Make him truly suffer and he will surely curse you. Once again, God is intrigued with Satan's proposition and agrees to it. Satan heads out to inflict Job with terrible sores from head to toe. Jacob in a lot of pain from those sores and with the loss of his fortune and family takes a shard of glass and scrapes the sores from his body before he sits in the ashes of his previous life. It has all gotten so bad for Job that his wife came and told him he should just curse God and be done with it all. Job forfeited, and he sat in that ash heap. But then something beautiful happens. Three of his friends join him, and they sit with Job. They sit with him in the ash heap, and they sit in silence. 
They sit in silence and they allow Job time to mourn, to be sad, to just be. They do this for seven days and seven nights, a perfect amount of time. And the Bible says they do this because they know the suffering that he had gone through was so great. After these seven days and night of silence, Job finally speaks and curses the day he was born, concluding that nothing good came from that day if it had all just led to this, to everything he loves and cares for, gone. It's unfortunate what comes next comes next. Because after seven days and night of being good, good friends, those same friends ruin it all by speaking. They speak, but they do not speak words of comfort or consoling. Instead, they each begin to rationalize with Job over why these terrible things had befallen him. They do this for many, many chapters, with each friend sharing a new and insightful idea after new and insightful idea explaining away Job's hurt and loss. They rationalize that Job must have done something to deserve such a severe punishment. They all go back and forth over and over, everyone trying to understand what, why that, what had happened happened. And around every argument, every point made, Job rebukes them all, but he never curses God. What he does do is challenge and question Where is God's justice? What have I done to deserve this? Why me? Why my children? Here are just a few sections from his final defense. How I long for the months gone by, for the days when God watched over me. When his lamp shone on my head, and by his light I walked through darkness. Oh, for the days when I was in my prime, when God's intimate friendship blessed my house When the Almighty was still with me and my children were around me, when my path was drenched with cream and the rock poured out for me streams of olive oil. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. I know you will bring me down to death to the place anointed for all the living. Job shares some pretty intense words, but given what he's gone through, they make sense, at least to me. I also would have had questions and concerns to bring to God. I would languish in not understanding what I had done to deserve such a terrible fate. Then something happens. Something that hadn't happened yet in this story. God shows up. And he shows up in the most unusual of ways, in a whirlwind. And he has this to say. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come but no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you ever journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you even comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which are reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? 
What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? To a water, to water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whom, from whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? That's just a small taste of what God has to say to Job. So you may be asking yourself, why have I spent most of my time this morning in this sermon speaking about Job when I'm our really here just to speak about Psalm 139. Well, it's because of this, the whirlwind. When I read through one, Psalm 139, I couldn't help but think about the whirlwind. Let's look at it again. God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there, then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit? To be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. Your thoughts, how rare, how beautiful, God, I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them in any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and live always with you. And please, God, do away with wickedness for good. And you murderers out there, all the men and women who belittle you, God, infatuated with cheap God imitations. See how I hate those who hate you, God? See how I loathe all those, this godless arrogance? I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my enemies. Investigate my life, O oh God. Find out everything about me cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. David gives us a beautiful view of the Lord, someone who is ever-present, ever-watchful, ever-there. Earlier in this sermon, I shared a quote from C.S. Lewis about the purpose of the Psalms as lyrical, to be sung, to be felt. And I chose today's sermon to focus less on theology, dissecting the poem down to its base parts, analyzing with you. Instead, I chose this psalm because it was a psalm I needed to read right now. These past four months have been hard for all of us. I miss my Ross Carrick family. I miss singing with you. I miss the chats and I miss the terrible coffee. These past few months, I couldn't help but think of the church in light of Job. I know we aren't perfect, we aren't blameless, and we aren't always upright, but we are Christ's body, and we can't gather right now. Now please, don't misconstrue my point. It's incredibly important that we don't gather right now. It's important for the health of many people, many people close, very close to my heart. It's important we do our best together to lessen the impact of this virus will have on us as a people going forward. I just have to say I miss it. I miss it all. It's a challenging time for us, and it's good for us to acknowledge that 
this sucks. That this is not good. Necessary. But not good. So I can't help but ask the questions that Job asks. Then, you know, I'm reminded of God in the whirlwind and I'm, I find I'm quieted. Earlier I also mentioned that I wanted to talk about control. You see, I've, I've felt out of control these past few months. Many of the things I care about just left my life. The kids in my ministry, the students at my school, many friends and family, my church family, they all left without a single action of my doing. I did not send any of them away. I didn't hurt them and break our relationship. Something from the outside came in and took it all away. I feel out of control. And control is something I think we all struggle with in some way or another. Some desire it. Some desire it to have over others. Some desire it to never use it even when they should. Here's a, a quick aside. There's a fun story that help, helps, uh, I think will help emphasize what I mean by control. When Christian Herder was governor of Massachusetts, oh my goodness, I can't say Massachusetts. All right, you're just going to assume when he was governor, he was running hard for a second term in office. One day, after a busy morning chasing votes and no lunch, he arrived at a church barbecue. It was late afternoon, and Herder was famished. As Herder moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman serving chicken. She put a piece on his plate and turned to the next person in the line. <clears throat> Excuse me, governor said. Do you mind if I have another piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said again, only one to a customer. Governor Herder was a modest and unassuming man, but he decided that this was the time he throw a little weight around. Do you know who I am, he said? I'm the governor of this state. Do you know who I am, the woman said? I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along, sir. He just wanted more chicken, but she was the one in control. When I read God in the whirlwind, I see a God who is in control. I'm put in my place. How dare I ask for another piece of chicken? Was I there when that chicken was hatched that would eventually be served up at this barbecue? But you see, it's when I read Psalm 139 that I desire to transition. To move from a place of mourning, stuck in the ash heap of life these past few months. I desire to be inspired again. To move forward to find God's love and what it looks like in a world filled with injustice and suffering of all kinds. I want to move to where I presume David is. A place of peace understanding, confidence, and the feeling of being loved. I love the story of Job. It's a story that I need in my life. I need to, be remind, to remind myself that, that the depths of my suffering is nothing when compared to real suffering. But more importantly, that when I do suffer, God is still in control. He has been there from before the beginning of everything and will be there long after I have left. I need to be reminded that God wrestles the behemoth and captures the Leviathan, those monsters, those great monsters of chaos, that God truly is in control. But right now, I need David's perspective. Not only is God in control, but he loves me, you, us. He delights in knowing the very workings of all the intricacies that make us, us. How beautiful he is. May his will be forever done. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. To close, I'd like us to pray the psalm together. Now, I know you're sitting at home on your couch, or maybe you're on your phone, I don't know where, but just because we're to get not together doesn't mean we can't say these words together. So, I ask that you pray with me. <clears throat> God, investigate my life. 
get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you, even from a distance. You know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back. I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I look behind me and you're there. Then up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh, yes. You shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. Your thoughts. How rare, how beautiful. God, I'll never comprehend them. I couldn't even begin to count them. And any more than I could count the sand of the sea. Oh, let me rise in the morning and live always with you. And please, God, do away with wickedness for good. And you murderers out there, all the men and women who belittle you, God, infatuated with cheap God imitations, see how I hate those who hate you, God. See how I loathe all this godless arrogance. I hate it with pure, unadulterated hatred. Your enemies are my en enemies. Investigate my life, O oh God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. Amen. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, verse 1. Communion is a reminder that because of what Jesus did at the cross, God is always with us. No matter what trouble we are facing or what valley we might be walking through this morning, we are not alone. As we partake of communion together this morning, I want to encourage you to take a minute and pause to remember that not only did Jesus die and rise again so that we might have life, but he also sent the Holy Spirit to be with us always. You are not alone. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that you are here with us at this very moment. You know what struggle and darkness each of us is facing this morning, and I thank you that you are big, bigger than that struggle and darkness. This does not mean that we do not have to face these things, but it does mean that we do not have to face them alone. I thank you that you are with us always and that you have given us this beautiful reminder. It's even in the name, communion. As we partake of the emblems together this morning, would you please remind us that we are always connected to one another and to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we consider the psalm for this morning, I see the ever-presence of the Lord, not only in times of trouble, but in every other area of our lives as well. The sovereignty of our God in our yesterdays, in the things we're living through today, and in our days to come as well. Knowing that the Lord is always present helps immensely to bring a stillness to my soul so that when the waters roar and the mountains quake, which they tend to do more than I would want, I can rest in the knowledge that I can trust him in all things and to be with me in all things. There are many ways to communicate our trust in the Lord. Things like prayer of all kinds and various acts of faith demonstrate to all in heaven and on earth where our trust lays. We can also show our trust in the Lord in the way we give, both in attitude and deed, a portion of that which he has given to us, back to him as a faith offering. This morning, as you dedicate your offering to your church, be it Hope for Life, Ross Carrick, or Oak Park, I encourage you to remember the ever-presence of the Lord and allow the stillness of the soul that comes from trusting him to give you rest, peace, and assurance today. Let's pray. Lord, grant us today and in the coming week, when the mountains quake and the seas roar, an awareness of your presence that is greater than any fear that would try to grip our hearts and minds. This morning, as we dedicate our offering, we reaffirm afresh that we have placed our trust in you and we acknowledge your sovereignty over everything in our lives. With worshipful hearts and in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God. hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. Yours 
is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name Jesus, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We have one final song to finish off our service today, so would you join with us in worship? my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree
Well, thank you for joining us in worship this morning. If you need anything at all, prayer or anything like that, please feel free to call the church, email us. We'd be more than happy to help you out. Our benediction today is based on Psalm 139. It says, as we leave this place, let's not forget. There is nowhere we can go where God is not. Everywhere we go, God goes before us. From the farthest ocean to the highest mountain, from the heights of joy to the depths of despair, wherever we find ourselves, God is already there. So go in peace, for we do not go alone. Have a blessed week.